time and clock synchronization i am dr rajiv mishra working as professor in the department of computer science indian institute of technology patna content of this lecture in this lecture we will discuss the fundamentals of clock synchronization in the cloud and the different algorithms we will cover causality and a general framework of logical clocks and present two systems of logical clock namely the lamport and the vector time stamps to capture causality between the events in a distributed system now first let us understand the need of synchronization that is need of clock synchronization suppose you want to catch a bus at 9:05 am but your watch is off by 15 minutes what if your watch is late by 15 minutes you will miss the bus what if your watch is fast by 15 minutes then you will end up unfairly waiting for a longer time than you intended so there may be examples of such kind of problems where if your watch is late by 15 minutes then you will miss the bus or maybe some event and if your watch is fast by 15 minutes then you will end up unfairly waiting for a longer time than you intended so the time synchronization is therefore required for ensuring the correctness and the fairness so correctness if it is not guaranteed that means if the clock if your watch is late by 15 minutes then the event will happen before your watch is giving you that time therefore you will miss that event and this is the problem of correctness second problem is that if your watch is fast by 15 minutes then you will reach early to catch a bus and unfairly waiting for a longer than you intended and this problem is about the fairness so there is a need of clock synchronization that is neither so it has to ensure both correctness and the fairness together so let us now understand about the time and synchronization so uh, as far as the distributed time is concerned the notion of time is well defined at each location but the relationship between the time at different location is quite unclear and that is called the distributed time so the time synchronization is therefore as we have told in the previous slide that time synchronization is needed for correctness and fairness purposes now considering why the clock synchronization is needed in the cloud computing system take the example of a cloud based airline reservation system now let us take a particular server x so a client so a client one request to purchase a ticket the last ticket on the flight say pqr 1 2 it want to purchase this ticket the server time stamp the purchase using its local clock as 625 and then logs it and replies okay at this time it will say okay to the client because there is one seat left so that was the very last seat and the server x send a message to the server y so server y saying that the flight is full for example here there is server y so it will say that now the server so that the flight is full which flight 
that is PQR 1, 2, 3, 4 is full after booking this particular ticket. Now Y enters PQR is full and its local clock value is 6 o'clock then 20 minutes. It will point out that the flight is full. Now server Z. Queries X logs and Y logs. But server Z will confuse why because the ticket was booked at 6.25 as far as the timing of the server X is concerned. But server Y tells that 6.20 the flight was full and it was booked. So this may lead to the incorrect actions at the Z here in this case because 625 the, the ticket was booked and before that time it was showing that the flight was full because of the two different clocks are running that is at Y and at X and both the time when they are being I mean taken at Z so it will be an incorrect action being performed based on these timings. So therefore, in a cloud application it, where multiple servers are running, there are also requirement of a clock synchronization in various applications. Now therefore, the key challenge is, is that the end host in the internet based systems like cloud where each server has its own clock and CPU within one server or workstation they share the common system clock. So the processes in the internet based system all an asynchronous model that is <clears throat> no bounds on the message delays and the processing delays. So unlike multiprocessor that is a parallel computing system which follows the synchronous model. So let us understand with some of the definitions and then we will formulate the problem. So asynchronous distributed system consists of number of processes and each process has a state there that is being measured by the variables and each process will take the action to change its state which may be instruction or a communication action that is by send and receive. So an event is the occurrence of an event and each process has a large clock that is nothing but an event within a process that can be assigned time is time and thus order linearly. In a distributed system we also need to know the time the order of the event across the processes. So let us take this particular fact by a diagram which is called a state time diagram space time diagram. A space means these processes P1, P2 and P3 they are the distributed system processes running at different geographic rotation, uh, locations that is why this is space is being is been there and for each process P1 now it will run its events using the same clock called internal events. In the internal events there are two specific events one is the message send event which will communicate across the processors and message receive event also communicates across the process and all other events are called internal events. And the space time diagram of the distributed execution is shown here as an example. Now coming to the physical clock synchronization, there are two different issues. One is called clock skew, the other is called clock drift. Now each process that is running at some end host has its own clock. Now when you compare two clocks at two different processes, there exhibit a clock skew that is the relative difference in the clock values of two different processes. Then there is a concept which is called a clock drift that is the relative difference in the clock frequency rates of the two processes. So a non-zero clock skew <coughs> implies that the clocks are not synchronized, they are giving different timings. A non-zero clock drift causes the skew increases eventually. 
So if a, it is just like a faster vehicle is ahead, it will drift away and if a faster vehicle is behind, it will catch up and then drift away. Now coming to the clock inaccuracies. So clocks that must not only be synchronized with each other, but also have to adhere to the physical clocks are termed as physical clocks. The physical clocks are synchronized to an accurate real time standards. However, due to the clock inaccuracy, a timer or the clock is said to be working within a specification where the constant row is the maximum skew rate specified by that manufacturer, which is shown over here. Now the maximum drift rate of a clock, so absolute MDR, that is the maximum drift rate is defined to the relative coordinated universal time UTC is the correct time at any point of time. So MDR of any process depends on the environment. So the maximum drift rate between the two clocks with the similar MDR is two times MDR. So given a maximum acceptable skew M between any pairs of the clock, it need to synchronize at least once <coughs> every, that is M divided by two multiplied by MDR time units in this case. Now internal versus external versus internal synchronization, now consider a group of processes. So external synchronization, that is each process CI's clock is bounded D of a well-known clock S external to the to the group. So let us say CI is the process I's clock value and now a well-known clock S is an external. So CI minus S if you take the absolute value it has to be now bounded by D at all point of time called external synchronization. So external clock may be connected to the universal coordinated time or an atomic clock. So external synchronization is done by two different algorithms. One is called Christian's algorithm, the other is called network time protocol. Internal synchronization does not require an external universal coordinated time or an atomic clock. So every process, every pair of process in a group have the clock within the bound D. That is, if let us say two processes their internal clock C i and C j, the absolute value should be less than bounded by D at all point of time, then it is called internal synchronization. The two algorithms very commonly using the internal synchronization called Berkeley algorithm and data center time protocol. <clears throat> now external synchronization with, with D is same as implies that internal synchronization with 2D. That is internal synchronization does not imply the external synchronization achieved. So let us see some of the basic fundamentals of external time synchronization. So here you can see that all the processes P will synchronize with the time server S using the message exchange. So what's wrong here in this case? So P will send a message what's the time and S will respond here is the time T and it will set the clock with the time t. So what is wrong here in this particular way of uh, synchronizing the clock? By the time message has received at p here, the time has moved on, the time has moved on and p's time set to t is inaccurate. So inaccuracy a function of the message latency and some latencies are unbounded in an asynchronous system. The inaccuracies cannot be unbounded. So let us see about the Christian's algorithm. So Christian's algorithm uh, says that if let us say P measures the round trip time, that is RTT of a message exchange. Suppose we know that the minimum of P to S latency is called min 1. And the minimum S to P latency is called bin 2.
so min 1 and min 2 now depends upon the operating system overhead to buffer the messages tcp time to queue the message and so on <coughs> so the actual time at p when it receives a response is between t plus here let us say it's t so t plus min 2 this is t plus min 2 add to t plus rtt t plus rtt minus min 1 this one t plus rtt minus min 1 so the actual time at p when it receives the response is between t plus min 2 and t plus rtt t plus rtt minus min 1 that is this one and this one so p sets its time to the halfway through this particular interval that is t plus rtt plus m2 minus min 1 divided by 2 so error is at the most rtt minus min 1 minus min 2 divided by 2 and it is being bounded so these are the error bounds so the error will be in terms of t1 minus this is t1 minus t0 divided by 2 minus t min now the error bounds are already there it is allowed to increase the clock value but should never decrease the clock value may violate the ordering of the events within the same process now this error bounds is allowed to increase or decrease the speed of the clock if the error is too high take multiple readings and average them so christian's algorithm is explained again here in this particular example let us say that send request is at 5 o'clock 508 and receive response is at 508 15 900 it was 1500 so the response contains 509 25 300 that is t server elapsed time is a t1 minus t0 that is 900 minus 100 that is 800 milliseconds is the elapsed time that is shown over here now the time stamp was given 400 milliseconds ago here you can guess so you can set the server time is t server time plus the elapsed time that is 300 plus 400 that 700 so that is what is shown over in this particular case now if you can measure the error so 900 minus 100 divided by 2 minus 200 so here you can see this particular 900 900 is the active response 900 is this one 900 minus 100 divided by 2 minus 200 is equal to 800 divided by 2 and that is plus minus 200 that is an error which is bounded now another protocol is called network time protocol and network time protocol became the internet standard that is RFC 1305 network time protocol servers they are organized in the form of a tree now each client here is a leaf of a tree and each node synchronizes with its parents so let us see about the network time protocol here in this case a child will send a message let's start the protocol the parent will send the message one and its time of timestamp at one when it will receive let us say it will receive the message it will make the time called receive time tr1 and then it will prepare a message 2 with a timestamp called ts2 and the message 2 will receive the message at time tr2 and it will send the message with this timestamp 1 and timestamp 2 all the timestamps that is timestamp 1 
time is time tr2 and then time is time tr1 and ts2 all are available to the child and using all four time is time it will calculate an offset which is tr1 minus tr2 plus ts2 minus ts1 divided by 2 this is called an offset and let's calculate the error now let us say the real offset is o real so child will be ahead of the parent by o real plus and parent will be ahead by child minus o real suppose one way of the latency of the message one is l1 and let us see that nobody knows about l1 and l2 so tr1 is equal to ts1 plus l1 plus o real and tr2 is equal to ts2 plus l2 minus o real now then if you take these two equations and you subtract the second one from the first this is the first equation and this is the second equation so 2 minus 1 if you take in this case you will get an o real of this uh, point and if you if you see this is uh, this not this is nothing but small o that we have already defined then minus l2 minus l1 divided by 2 so o real minus o becomes l2 minus l1 divided by 2 which is also an upper bound with l2 plus l1 divided by 2 and this is nothing but a round trip time so error is bounded by the round trip time so berkeley's algorithm was given in 1989 now here the master pulls each machine periodically ask the machine for the time for that it can use the christian's algorithm to compensate the network latency now when the results are in compute include the master's time and hope that average cancels out the individual clock's tendency to run faster than slow so send the offset by which each clock needs adjustment to each slave and avoids the problem with the network delays so berkeley's algorithm is stated using this particular example now you can see that it is there are three different processes uh, 325 and uh, 250 and so on so berkeley's algorithm uh, can be stated using this particular diagram you can see that the master now will take the clock values of all the clients so the berkeley's algorithm uh, is shown over here so it will compute the per call and average here in this case by taking all three clock values and now it will not use one of these outliers that is 9 or 10 is an outlier compared to 325 and 250 and 3 so in the average it will take only the relevant time and outliers will be eliminated uh, in the berkeley's algorithm and once it is calculated 305 then now it will uh, be able to uh, to offset to send that uh, 325 that means it will take away the 20 of it uh, similarly uh, in this case uh, it will be uh, plus because 215 so 305 means uh, plus 15 and it will now then reduce minus uh, 605 here in this case now coming to the data center time protocol dtp now dtp is a globally synchronized time versus via the data center network so data center time protocol uses the physical layer of the network devices to implement the decentralized clock synchronization protocol it is highly scalable with bounded precision and uh, so so there is uh, it is an internal clock synchronization algorithm as we have said there are two types of clock synchronization so data center time protocol is is an internal clock synchronization where end to end is 200 nanoseconds So here you can see that uh, it runs in two phases between two peers initial phase is me measuring this particular time and then it will perform the resynchronization and uh, and so on so this uh, particular uh, diagram shows about the physical layer that is of, of the uh, switches and data center time protocol uh, has the property that provides the bounded precision and scalability in the hardware and is bounded by 4t and uh, this is all uh, being 
calibrated and but still it has a non zero error so the question is how to get rid of the error can we synchronize the clock altogether and still be able to order the events so why the clock synchronization is needed is to order the events in a distributed system so physical clock synchronization it has now an error bound even after the synchronization so therefore uh, let us see some of the issues which is related to the clock synchronization ordering of the event without having the physical clock synchronization now to order the event across the processes which are trying to synchronize the clock is an approach that we have seen called physical clock synchronization now what if we instead assign the time stamp to the events that were not the absolute time so as long as this time stamp obey causality that would work so if an event a causally happens before another event b then the time stamp of a is less than time stamp of b now this logical or a lampard ordering of the logical clock was proposed by leslie lampard in 1970 and is almost used and is used in almost all the distributed systems since then and almost all the cloud computing system use some form of the logical ordering of the events so lampard's research contributions are summarized over here and it has laid down the foundation of distributed system and today's cloud the notable papers notable works are the time clock and ordering of events in a distributed system which has got to him conferred with an potsy influential paper award in 2000 how to make multi processor computer that correctly executes multi process programs the byzantine journals program distributed snapshots and part time parliament all these papers are seminal papers and they have been contributing to the today's cloud computing so it's worth mentioning here so these paper relate to the concepts such as logical clocks byzantine failures and they are the most cited papers in the field of computer science and describe the algorithm in a distributed system so paxos algorithm for consensus bakery algorithm for mutual exclusion of multiple threads in a computer system that require the same resource at the same time chaldin lapard algorithm for determining for determination of a consistent global state snapshot the lampard signature is one of the prototype of a digital signature so let us start with the lampard or a logical ordering so it will define the logical relation that is happened before relation among the pair of events and this relation is mentioned by this particular relation symbol now happened before relation has governing three different rules the first says that on the same process that is the a happened before b this means the time stamp of a should be less than the time stamp of b similarly if a sends a message m to p then send off the message m has happened before the receive of the message m so together rule 1 and rule 2 is being used in defining the transitivity relation that is if a has happened before b and b has happened before c this implies that a has happened before c and together this particular relation happened before relation creates a partial order among all the events <coughs> in the distributed system why it is called partial order because not all the events are being related with this happened before relation that is why it is it is a partial order take this particular example in a space time diagram of a happened before relation so a has happened before b if let us say that a and b they are all internal events b has happened before f so b has happened before f this can be seen that b has happened before e b has happened before e and e has happened before f using transitivity b has happened before f and that is what is correct over here a has happened before f so a and f now you can see that uh, a has happened before b and that b has happened before before f so a has happened before f here in this particular 
case of the example. Similarly, you can also check whether H has happened before G or not. So H has happened before G. So let us see that H has happened before E using send off message. Then E has happened before uh, F. E has happened before G. So therefore H has happened before G. F has happened before J. So F has happened before J. So F has happened before D and E and, and E has happened before D and J has happened before E. Therefore F has happened before J. C has happened before J can also be concluded in the same way. Now coming to the Lampert's timestamp, the goal is to assign the logical or a Lampert timestamp to each event's timestamp and that obeys the causality. So rule 1 says that each process use the local counter that is the clock which is an integer initially the count, count clock initially the counter is initialized to 0 and each process increments the counter when the send or an instruction <coughs> happens at it. So the counter is assigned to the event as its timestamp send off message uh, event carries its timestamp receive of a marriage message event uh, the, the counter is updated by the max of local clock and the message timestamp plus one. So here you can see that particular clocks are initialized to zero then the first event is timestamp one and the second event will be measured by taking the maximum of local time and the message which it carries the time plus one. So maximum of zero, so here it uh, maximum of zero that is the local time and there is a local time maximum of zero and one is the time which is being carried here in this particular message that will add then plus one. So it becomes two. So the value is two here in this case. Similarly, you can calculate the timestamp here. So the local time is two that is over here and the message also will contain the time two, two maximum of two and two is two plus one that is three. So timestamp of this particular message will become three here in this case. Similarly here, the maximum of, um, of uh, this three and uh, four, uh, this, this particular time is, let us say three, oh, sorry, this is three, uh, the local time is three and uh, the time which is carried in the message is four and this is five. Now similarly, if you see that A has happened before B, this means that the timestamp of A is less than the timestamp of B. And this is what they are obeying the causality. So H has happened before G. Here you can see that H has happened before, before G. Then the timestamp of H is less than G. And that is it is obeying the causality. Now in certain cases when C has happened before F or not, when uh, C has happened before F or not, since there is no exchange of messages between C and F, they are not even ordered, you know that using happened before relation. Both are having values 3 in that case. So this is not correct. So such events which is not governed by happened before relation, they are called concurrent events. They cannot be ordered in that case. So the concurrent event that is a pair of concurrent doesn't have the causal path from one event to another event. So the logical timestamp does not guarantee to be ordered or unequal for concurrent events. So the concurrent events not causality is not causality related. So you have to remember that E1 has happened before E2. This means the timestamp of E1 is less than timestamp of E2. And the timestamp of E1 is less than timestamp of E2. This means that E1 has happened before E2 or E1 and E2 are concurrent events. Now coming to the vector clocks, 
which are used in the key value stores such as react so each process uses the vector of integer clocks suppose that there are n process in the group then each vector has n elements so process i maintains the vector <coughs> vi from 1 to n so jth element of the vector clock at process i is ith knowledge of the latest events at the process j so implementing the vector clocks so on an instruction or send event at a process i it increments only its ith element of its vector clock so each message carries the send events vector timestamp and on receiving the message at a process i it will increment its own vector and by looking up the other vector elements it will take the maximum of the values from the other or from the local for all the values j which is not equal to i so let us take the example so here vector clocks initially all values are 0 0 0 here in this case now this particular clock will be incremented because it's a internal event now the next event will be you can see that this is the internal event this is one and it will be sent in the message when the message will receive so the local event is zero will become one in that case what about other clock values so the clock values zero and zero will become zero here in this case and um, this will be taken over by value of two and one will become one which is not incremented here in this case so uh, if you see uh, causally uh, causally related events so vector v vt1 is equal to vector vt2 if and only if the vectors vector elements all the elements when both are equal similarly vector t1 is less than or equal to vector t2 if for all the events vector t1 of i is less than or equal to vector t2 the two events are causally related if if vt1 is strictly less than vt2 so here you can see that this implies that if and only if vector t1 is less than or equal to vector t2 and there exists some j such that between uh, between i and n there exists a j such that this vector t1 of j is strictly less than vector 2 hence it is so two events v1 vt1 and v2 are concurrent if neither vt1 is less than or equal to vt2 and not nor vt2 is less than or equal to therefore both are all parallel or concurrent even vector clocks obeys the causality for example is a has happened before b if you see the vector clocks of a 100 0, 0, is less than 200 0, 0. similarly for b is happened before f that means the vector clock value of b is 200 0, 0, is less than 221 similarly um, all others which are shown over here they follow now coming to the parallel event or concurrent event you can see that c and f they are concurrent event why because the vector clock values of c and f is neither c is less than or equal to f nor f is less than or equal to c hence they are concurrent events let us summarize then in that case about logical timestamp lamp or timestamp is an integer clocks assigned to the events obey causality and cannot distinguish the concurrent events vector timestamp obey the causality and by using more space can also identify the concurrent events so conclusion is that the clocks are unsynchronized in a asynchronous distributed system but need to order the events across the processes in the distributed system physical clock synchronization algorithms christians berkeley's network time protocol data center time protocol has an error function of round trip time you can avoid the time synchronization altogether by instead assigning the logical time stamp to the to the events thank you